afternoon. Welcome to the City Club. I'm Paddy Tillett, President of the City Club. I'd like to welcome you to another Friday Forum on a topic that's very important to our community on the subject of homelessness. Not a new problem in Portland, but one which is growing as economic hardship affects the lives of more and more people. Our panelists today are Jean DeMaster, Executive Director of YWCA, Kathy Oliver, Executive Director of Outside In, and Rob Justice, Executive Director of JOIN. Welcome to the City Club panel. I also want to welcome our special guests today. We have 55 students from Oregon Episcopal School, and we have 25 members of Portland's homeless community. It's a great pleasure to have you here and to share our forum with you today. On Friday, December the 14th, we'll examine the prevailing and increasing problem of global warming with Aileen Klassen, president of Pew Center on Global Climate Change. That will be at the Benson Hotel in the Mayfair Room. Please note the change in location. The club is participating this year in the Toys for Tots holiday drive, and we'll be collecting new unwrapped toys at the December 14th and 21st programs, both of which will be at the Benson Hotel. We'd appreciate whatever you're able to bring with you for that drive. Forgive me for mentioning again the pledge card and letter asking you to participate in this year's annual fund campaign. Many of you have done so already, but we're still $16,000 away from our $95,000 goal. I'd urge you to write that all-important check to the City Club before the year-end tax deadline gets to us. A few weeks ago, we decided to introduce name tags at Friday forums. You'll find blank tags at your table. Please use one and wear it during the program. This is your opportunity to meet and to get to know people and for them to get to know you. If you have questions about the club, board and staff members are wearing plastic name tags, in spite of the fact that I've forgotten to put mine on. Our bo bo board host sitting at the head table is Colleen Craft, member of the Board of Governors and Realtor with the Hassan Company. She will have the privilege of asking the first question of our panel. Following Colleen's question, we'll open the program to questions from City Club members in the audience. Please line up behind the microphone during Colleen's question so that we can take full advantage of our speaker's time. Please identify yourself and ask your question in 30 seconds or less. We, um, we enforce this quite strictly. We've had a request for the panel to be photographed with some members of the audience after this session, so we'll do it immediately um, afterwards over by the tree here. Broadcasts of City Club programs this quarter are made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Warehouser, from Enterprise Rent-A-Car, and from Pacific Care, and we're very grateful for their support. Jean DeMaster has been an effective advocate for the homeless in Portland for over 20 years now. I remember her impassioned pleas on their behalf when we were working on the Central City Plan in the mid-80s. Jean worked with Bud Clark and Don Clark to develop the original shelter reconfiguration plan, as well as helping to develop Oregon's homeless assistance plan. After four years with Multnomah County, Jean joined the YWCA in 1998, broadening her advocacy effort to include homeless families. No doubt she'll tell us something about Yolanda House, which is a shelter for survivors of domestic violence, and the Safe Haven Shelter for homeless families. Jean DeMaster has a degree in psychology and a master's in clinical psychology from the University of Minnesota. She serves on the boards of the Women's Foundation of Oregon, Pacific Crest Community School in Northeast Portland, and has served on the boards of Oregon Shelter Network, Outreach Ministries in Burnside, the Women's Resource Fund, and others. Kathy Oliver has been director of Outside In for 20 years. Now that simple statement should impress you more than a whole page full of plaudits and honors. However, I will tell you that she has a PhD in urban studies and that she started a number of innovative, extraordinary, and often controversial programs for homeless youth that include transitional housing and employment programs and that she's addressed some of the particular services needed by a sexual minority homeless youth. Rob Justice returned to Portland in 1991 with a graduate degree, a wife and two children. He began at once working with local service agencies assisting homeless people. 
He and some colleagues recognized a new approach to service provision for the homeless that built on the strengths of individuals and developed the power of personal connections. Thus, JOIN was founded in 1992. Their efforts have led to a steady stream of individuals leaving the streets for permanent housing. There were 369 such successes last year, with a 96% of them still in place a year later. JOIN provides a new approach to an age-old problem and has a record of proven successes. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panel. Thank you very much. It's very much of an honor for me to be here at the City Club again. Let me begin by asking the question and answering it, but asking the question first, um, what is homelessness? And I think that homelessness is America's most extreme form of poverty. That is to say that homelessness is poverty in its most extreme form. But I want to talk a little bit about the history of homelessness before we start talking about homelessness in specific groups of people here in Portland. Homelessness in America did not happen suddenly. If it had, like the tragedies that befell our country on September 11th, Americans would have, Americans would have responded in a dramatic form. But homelessness in America came on gradually. Even as recently as the 1970s, we had hardly begun to use the word homelessness. Even now, 30, but now, 30 years later, homelessness is a commonplace word. In just that 30-year period of time, a word which we never used is now used all the time. It, it did not, the word homeless did not appear, for example, in computer spell checks. It didn't even show up in the spell check until the late 1980s. So homelessness is a relatively new phenomenon in our country. When we think about homelessness for more than 30 years ago, it usually meant thinking about people who were living on skid row, people who were living in flop houses, maybe open drinking on the streets, lots of day labor jobs. For people that are as old as I am, you remember the song Roger Miller sang about uh, King of the Road. I won't sing it, but you remember the two hours of pushing broom by an 8 by 12 two-bit room. Um, it was those days of homelessness that were in the 70s and preceding the 70s. But after that, the face of homelessness really changed. In the 70s and even in the 80s, we didn't see homelessness um, of youth on our streets, and we didn't see homelessness striking families. Even 20 years ago, when I started working at transition projects, the shelter served about 100 men and 10 women. At that point, there only were 10 women coming and asking for shelter, but now there are hundreds of single women coming and asking for shelter. There were no shelters in the 70s or even in the early 80s for homeless youth or homeless families. In most cases, any homeless youth or homeless family that was on, on the brink of being homeless was taken in by family members, friends, or church members, and that can't happen today. In the 1970s and then into the 1980s, the face of homelessness began to change. First of all, we began to realize what we should have always known is that women and children who are being beaten or being abused by their spouses should not have to live with that kind of abuse. In the 1970s and more so in the 1980s, shelters and advocacy groups were formed for victims, more accurately for survivors, of domestic violence. Many of the victims of domestic violence are killed by their partners. We can't think of homelessness as a benign thing. Victims of homelessness, victims of, homeless, of domestic violence are killed by their partners or significant others. Others, those who live, the survivors of domestic violence, seek shelter. Then, as now, 80% of the survivors of domestic violence are women and children, many times children who have been witness to that domestic violence. We can't forget that homelessness is a women's issue. Throughout the 1980s, the number of women, children, and youth in the homeless population began to grow, began to be more visible, and began to require more services. For example, by 1987, the shelter at Transition Projects was then serving 35 women, where just five years earlier it was serving 10. It was that kind of growth in homelessness that we began to see in the 1970s and 1980s. 
At the same time, the institutions for the mentally ill were closing. Mentally ill people were returned to the community, but the funding to adequately serve them was not returned to the community. As a result, then and now, thousands of people with mental illness become homeless, and there are not adequate resources to serve them. While most are single adults, some of the people who become homeless are parents, and they bring their children with them. A third cause of homelessness, its increase, is drug use. While that was sort of fashionable or hip in the 1970s and 1980s, it really took its toll in the 1990s and afterwards. Large numbers of people with long histories of use and abuse of alcohol and drugs could no longer function on their jobs or in their families or in their communities. Combining drug and alcohol addiction, the percentage of Americans affected by alcohol and drug addiction is thought to be at least 5% of the population. In a city like Portland with a million people, 5% is 50,000 people. That's 50,000 people directly affected by alcohol and drug use. It doesn't even measure the number that are indirectly affected. Now, if those 50,000 people could receive treatment, if they could benefit from treatment, and if they had family and other support to assist them, they probably would not become homeless. But my estimate is that about 10% of the 50,000 people affected by alcohol and drug addiction did not have the benefit of treatment or the benefit of family and other support, and they did become homeless. That's about 5,000 people at any time. Another factor in the rise of homelessness is family values. In the 1980s and 1990s, the divorce rate increased and step families became the rule, no longer the exception. Teenagers no longer fit into these new families. Parents let teenagers leave, sometimes kicking them out. Teenagers left. Parents would want them to come home and they wouldn't. It went both ways, but we began to see increasingly large numbers of homeless teenagers on our streets in every major city, including Portland. I'm going to leave it to Kathy Oliver to tell the rest of that story. But the final factor, I think, in the rise of homelessness is just plain economics. More and more families, in particular, became homeless because they did not have the money to pay the rent. Homeless families have always been less visible than homeless youth and homeless sing single men and women. When families become homeless, they have to become invisible, fearing that if they are visible at all, their children will be taken away from them. Some of us can imagine what it would be like to be a homeless adult, but it's hard to imagine what it would be like to be a homeless child. Or imagine being a homeless parent with your children looking up at you and asking, Mom, where are we going to sleep tonight? Or Dad, I'm hungry. Can't we get something to eat? As a homeless parent, over and over again, you have no good answer for your children to questions like those. Homeless parents do not want to be homeless. Generally, they have done everything they can think of to avoid the situation of homelessness for themselves and for their children. Homeless families have exhausted all of their alternatives and resources. For a number of reasons, they are homeless parents who cannot get jobs, who cannot get enough money to support their families. The YWCA operates the safe haven shelter for homeless families. Every night, we serve nine families who are desperate to end their homelessness, but do not have the resources to do so. Let me give you an example. The most typical family in the safe haven shelter is a single mom with two children. The children are preschool children, and she does not have enough money to pay for three things. The child care while she works, rent, and food. Those are the three things that she can't pay for. She can't live with her parents because they are deceased or they're not living in Portland, or they themselves do not have the resources to take her in. Her husband is not paying child support. He is either not working or he's not in Portland or not in Oregon. She can find a minimum wage job, Maybe it pays $6.50 an hour or $7 an hour. It might even pay $9 an hour. But again, that is not enough money to pay rent, food, and childcare for her children while she works. 
Now, my guess is if you are generally a person who eats lunch here at the city club, you are probably not a homeless person. Probably. But for the moment, put yourself in the place of a homeless person. Let's say Emma. Emma is a person staying at the safe haven shelter. Now, I'm not using her real name, but she has two children. I ask you, what would you do if you had two children ages two and five? Just imagine you had two children ages two and five. You had a high school degree, but no particular, no special job skills. Your parents were divorced. Your mom had died and your dad had remarried and moved to Florida with his new wife and they would not take you in. You lost your job about four months ago and have not been able to find another job. What would you do? When Emma's last job ended and she could not find another job, she couldn't pay the rent, so she moved in with her friends. She stayed with friends for three months. But after three months of moving from friend to friend, she no longer had any friends with whom she could stay, and she came to the safe haven shelter. Emma and her children are very typical of homeless families. Although she did not abuse drugs and alcohol, it was really alcohol and drug abuse that caused her family to be homeless because her ex-husband was an alcoholic, and that's why he couldn't keep a job. He was ashamed that he had left his family and that he couldn't support his family, and so he left Portland. He actually left Oregon. She had a job, but she lost her job. Knowing that the cause of his desertion was alcohol and drug addiction didn't help bring money for food or rent to Emma's family. Emma had to begin to do that on her own. When she wasn't able to, she came to the shelter. The purpose of shelters for families is to give people like Emma a chance to rebuild the life for her family and her, for ch and her children. The Safe Haven Shelter offers a place to stay, an address, a telephone while she looks for a job, food, a place where employers can call her back, and gives her a chance to look for a job, not just the first job that comes along, but a job that might have a chance for an advancement in salary so that she would be able to pay for all of the things that she wants to and all of us want to for our children. Emma is either going to wait for transitional housing in one of the local agencies or housing through the Housing Authority of Portland. Emma and her, two, and her two children are a typical homeless family, but the Safe Haven Shelter also serves two-parent families and families with single-parent fathers. We are the only shelter in Portland that can do that, keeping a family together. Portland has six shelters for homeless families. Three of them are operated by local churches, and these churches are to be commended. The First Methodist Church, the Sunnyside Methodist Church, and the Reedwood Friends Church. These shelters are open in the evening, they're closed in the daytime, and families are left on their own with very few resources. The church shelters are also open for about half of the year. They're open for the winter months, but not for the summer months, although homelessness does not end in the summer months. Portland also has three, families for shel three shelters for families which stay open year-round. The Salvation Army Shelter is year-round, and it operates also a day shelter in the wintertime. The East Portland Metropolitan Hospitality Network operates year-round, having four churches share the night shelter responsibility, and then also a day shelter, and the YWCA Safe Haven. There's also transitional housing for families. Transitional housing generally goes for a period up to 24 months and gives family a lot, families a lot longer time to resolve the issues of homelessness. And agencies like Portland Impact, Neighborhood House, and Human Solutions provide transitional housing. But there is very little of a safety net for another kind of family that I talked about early, and that's families that are homeless because of domestic violence. While there are five shelters for victims of domestic violence, um, Bradley Angle House, the Salvation Army Shelter, Volunteers of America, Raphael House, and the Yolanda House Shelter operated by the YWCA, it's estimated that for every five women who calls in a time of need because she's a victim of domestic violence, only one of those women will be able to have her call answered by finding a place in, shel in shelter. The other four will be turned away or asked to wait. Now, if you add all of this up, it might sound like, oh, there's a lot of resources for homeless families. After all, there's five shelters for survivors of domestic violence, seven shelters for homeless families, there's transitional housing. Isn't this plenty, you might ask? 
In fact, the resources for homeless families are markedly insufficient. Multnomah County and the City of Portland measure the number of people who are homeless, and their estimates are that about 43% of homeless families in need on any night can receive help. Not even half. Not even half of the homeless families in need are able to receive help. The, the current resources for shelter for homeless families and for many shelters are insufficient to begin with and especially now are very unstable. Many shelters rely on donations for the community in order to survive. But because of the downturn in the Oregon economy and because many of us have necessarily sent our resources to um, New York or to Washington DC to help with the September 11th tragedy, many of those resources that might have come to help local shelters or local programs now will not come this year. Let me give you an example of what we're looking at with the safe haven shelter budget. Our budget for a year is about $243,000. Of that, we received $36,000 from Multnomah County and $36,000 from the city and the county voucher program. So against the $243,000 cost, we receive about $72,000. But that leaves the YWCA with an additional $171,000 to raise each year to keep the safe haven shelter opening. With fundraising dollars down this year, the future looks bleak for our shelter, and I suspect for many shelters and for many other nonprofit agencies in the Portland area this year. Let me just close by looking for a minute at how many people are homeless in Portland each night. The last count of the, homel of the homeless was done on um, November 15th, or the last count I have the data for was done on November 15th. And at that time, over 1,800 people, on that night, over 1,800 people were homeless. That's about six times the number of people in this room. So if we want to look at how many people are homeless, six times the number of us that are here today. Actually, on that night, there were 1,837 people who were homeless. 50% of them were single adults. 2% of them were homeless youth. And 48% of them were people in homeless families. Of these 1,837 people who were homeless, 49% were white and 51% were people of color. It is very clear that homelessness and poverty, poverty strikes people of color in a disproportionately high percentage. Of the 51% who were people of color, 20% were African American, 20% were Hispanic, 2% were Native American, 1% were Asian, and 8% described themselves of being of mixed heritage. In summary then, as you turn to go to bed tonight, you can be sure that over 1,800 other people in our community are sleeping in shelters, in transitional housing, in their cars, in city parks, in designated areas, or other places outside where it is cold and wet. To me, thinking about 1,800 other people who are homeless is very unsettling. Please remember, though, that no one wants to be homeless. Once you're homeless, it is very hard to get out. Homeless people, like everybody else, want to solve their own problems, but they have to rely on non-homeless people, like you and I, to help them do that. Only you can provide the resources that help homeless people resolve their own problems and get out of this form of extreme poverty in America. Thank you. Um, there are an estimated 1,500 to 2,000 homeless youth in Portland each year. These are adolescents under the age of 21, and while some of them are runaways, most of them are throwaways, which means they are youth for whom going home is not a viable option. About 50% of these youth are from the Portland metropolitan area. There's another group that are from around the state, because if you run away in Oregon, Portland is the big city, and you tend to come here. And then there's another group from out of state. Um, 
the reasons that youth are on the street are likely different from the reasons that adults are on the streets. While homeless youth may be unemployed and may not have jobs, that's really not why they're on the, why they're on the streets. The primary reason youth are homeless is because of abuse, abuse in the home. Another reason they're on the streets is just families that um, are not, not able to adequately care for them or are dysfunctional. And I, I can give you an example. One young man, um, there was no father in the home. His mother introduced him to drugs. And he had a younger sister, and he was afraid the same thing would happen to her. He took her and left home, believing he could give her a better upbringing on the streets than she would receive at home and they made their way eventually to outside in. There's another group of youth on the street who are there because they're sexual minority youth. And it turns out that among homeless youth, 30% are gay, lesbian, bisexual, or trans youth. This is a much higher rate than in the general population. And at outside in, we've started special services specifically for sexual minority kids. But again, um, this was not OK in families and the youth we're often kicked out. And then finally, there's a group of youth who, um, frankly, can be difficult, um, in and out of trouble with the law, maybe um, cannot or, or do not obey the rules of the family, and the family come to a parting of the ways. But for whatever reason, youth are on the streets, and once they're homeless, they're, they have some limited options for survival. Um, they often don't have a high school diploma, they don't have job experience, job skills. And some of them turn to survival sex or other illegal means of obtaining resources. What Portland has done is designed a system of services for these youth. It's funded primarily by Multnomah County and partly by the city of Portland. And I think it's a unique model. And I want to talk about it today. I think it's actually a model for the country. Four agencies have come together and formed a collaborative partnership to provide both a safety net of services for homeless youth and transitional services. They've defined a clear role for each partner and have eliminated duplication of services. The four partners are the Salvation Army Greenhouse, Janus Youth Programs, New Avenues for Youth, and Outside In. And as, as, as I've said, we've defined a clear role for each. The Salvation Army Greenhouse has provided a 24-hour access and assessment center. So youth can go there 24 hours a day, have a safe, warm place off the streets, get a meal, and be screened, receive an assessment, and a referral on into the system or to another service as appropriate. Janus Youth Programs provides two overnight shelters specifically for homeless youth. New Avenues for Youth offers day programs, case management, and transitional housing for younger homeless youth. And Outside In offers day programs, case management, transitional housing for older homeless youth. This system works. Last year, the Access Center provided shelter off the streets for 1,100 homeless youth. The transitional housing programs at New Avenues and at Outside In had an 80% success rate. That means 80% of the kids who entered our programs did not return to the streets, but achieved independent living. Um, each of the agencies also offers some supplemental services. For example, Janus Youth Programs provides on-street outreach seven days a week. New Avenues for Youth offers an alternative school that is able to be used by the kids at all the agencies. And they're also a satellite site for youth opportunities. Outside In offers an employment program that, um, by the way, last year helped 63 kids get jobs, which was pretty fabulous. Um, we also, at Outside In, offer um, a medical clinic, uh, which is, is pretty important, not only because kids are sick and need medical help, but because the practitioners, in some ways, take the place of the parents and teachers who function for roles um, as advocates and protectors of kids who are not homeless. For example, a youth can come to our clinic and they might have bronchitis, 
or some kind of upper respiratory problem from being outside in the cold. And what the practitioners can do is not only deal with that medical problem, but also provide them with counseling and education around alcohol drug use, nutrition, pregnancy prevention, safer sex, sexual transmit sexually transmitted diseases, and especially HIV testing and counseling. And the latter is important because homeless youth are so vulnerable to HIV. And again, at Outside In, we, we provide a needle exchange program for older kids. They have to be age 18 or over. And last year, we exchanged 300,000 syringes. Um, we also provide HIV education and counseling and support groups for the, for the other younger kids. And then finally, we have two housing units set aside for HIV-positive homeless youth. There are gaps in the service system for homeless youth. Altogether, we have no more than 50 transitional housing units for the 1,500 to 2,000 homeless youth in the system. We also often have a waiting list for youth wanting to be in case management, which I consider to be unconscionable. And while the county and the city fund the basic core services of safety and housing and case management, they don't fund um, some of the supplemental services that are absolutely necessary. For example, in transitional housing, we now know that the two main reasons youth do not succeed in housing are first, alcohol drug use, and second, mental health issues. So as a system, the four agencies got together and invited um, Network Behavioral Health and DePaul Adolescent Treatment Services to join us and applied for a national grant, which we were successful in getting, to start providing the outreach and alcohol drug services that homeless youth need in order to be successful in exiting the system. So in summary, um, I think we've put together a system that, although it has gaps, works. And our goals for that system are to provide a safe place for kids off the street and give them an, a, keep them safe and give them a chance to grow up. And second of all, to provide the transitional housing and support services that will truly help youth trade street life for independent living and achieve our goal of preventing them from simply growing up to join the adult homeless population. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I have been working uh, with homeless community uh, for 10 years, though uh, with the panel here, I'm definitely the new kid on the block. Uh, enjoying our organization, uh, though we are nine years old, uh, are definitely still the, the new kids on the block as an organization. Uh, and I'm honored to uh, speak uh, with our panelists here who have dedicated their lives uh, to this work. I'd like to speak a little bit about our organization, JOIN. Uh, our organization started in 1992, and when we did, uh, we first started really looking at how can we provide some dialogue between the homeless and housed community. And in doing that, we really sought out homeless individuals to be the ones who needed to educate us. And what evolved out of those relationships and those conversations is that homeless individuals really designed for us an organization which they would like to see not only help them, but, but help the community. What came out of that dialogue was some very specific needs that people identified but also, more importantly, a very specific way, the way people wanted to be treated and how they wanted to be worked with. Which was fascinating for us was when we started to put this together, a lot of folks in the community told us that we were wasting our time. And the reason why they did that is because our target population were going, was going to be people who were sleeping outside, very specifically homeless campers. And when we had people from the city and the county said, well, you know, that's great, but you know, we've designed this system and you know, people need to, to access the system. And if they're not seeking shelter, you know, our assumption is that they don't want to end their homelessness. 
but we knew through our conversations with homeless individuals that not to be true. So we proceeded to one, create a facility where basic services could be utilized, basically a home base for individuals who were sleeping outside, a place where people could shower, do their laundry, have an address, kind of the basics, you know, store their belongings, the things uh, of being able to create a place where people can begin to deal with the issues at hand, begin a process to transition off the streets. The other thing people identified for us was that they wanted somebody to work with them, that they obviously recognized that they needed allies, but what they wanted was not necessarily to be case managed, but what they wanted was somebody to be in solidarity and work with them. And so what we did is we uh, developed and what eventually grew into uh, the creation of an outreach team. Individuals who would go out into the community, not wait for folks to come to us, outreach workers would, that would go under bridges, engage people where they are at. And in that, begin to build a relationship. To begin to build a relationship with homeless individuals from where they're at and letting them create the process of transition. Where we are today is that JOIN has evolved where we have an outreach team of five individuals. Those five individuals work with people throughout the city of Portland. Those individuals actually geographically are broken up into the different police precincts, which there are five of them. Part of the reason why we designed it that way is we recognize in talking to people who were camping, that were sleeping outside, and when we talked to them, their primary interaction with anybody from the community typically was police officers. And what we wanted to say is, you know, should not it rather be police officers, shouldn't it not be outreach workers, folks that are engaging people with the opportunity to, to transition off the streets. And so we tried to place ourselves in between the police officers and the homeless individuals and try to create uh, compromises, if you will. Because one of the things we knew that if anybody was gonna begin the process of transitioning off the street, they need stability. They needed a place they knew they could go back to and they could sleep. They needed a place where they knew they could take a shower, do their laundry, get phone calls. They needed to create some stability for themselves. And even if that stability was a place under a bridge, <laughs> you know, at least that was better than not knowing every night where you're gonna, gonna sleep and not knowing whether the police were gonna come in and move you out. One of the things when we first started doing outreach, we uh, first saw ourselves primarily working with individual homeless folks. Also, we saw ourselves trying to engage people and move them into the system. What we learned real quickly was one, trying to transition people into the system at times was almost impossible because the system is at capacity. The amount of people that are turned away from the system on a daily basis, as Jean mentioned, is staggering. And what we found is lots of individuals who were on the streets didn't even try because they knew that either they would be turned away or they in the, themselves were saying, you know what, I'm an individual, I'm gonna make it, you know, I'm gonna try to do it my way. Uh, and so what we began to realize is, is there another way to transition people off the streets other than transitioning people or trying to get people into the system itself? The other thing that we recognized uh, early on was it wasn't just homeless individuals that we were talking about. We began to come across countless numbers of families, people living in their car, people not able to access the system, or people afraid of trying to access the system because they're afraid of what might happen to them and their children. So as we began to look at the, this issue and this problem, we had occasion to go to a meeting uh, at the city and county that was a meeting of housing specialists. And we asked the housing specialists, we said, where are you, know, you moving people into housing? And we had somebody that dropped a book in front of us, and they said, well, right there. And we started to thumb through the book, and it was all subsidized housing. Uh, CDCs uh, throughout the Portland community. And they said, well, good luck, because you know, they all have waiting lists. 
You know, and for us, we said to ourselves, you know what, that is not acceptable. One, we knew that we had lots of people who were sleeping outside who desperately wanted to end their homelessness. So what we started to do is we started to work with those individuals to, one, have some type of income. Uh, and today what we find is about 60% of the folks that we see transitioning to housing are doing that through employment. And about 40% of those folks are doing that through some type of subsidy. But the key was to find people in the community who were landlords, property management companies, that would take our individuals. And so we began to uh, do a lot of one-on-ones, uh, smoozing, I guess you would call it. Uh, I remember one of our outreach workers one Thanksgiving going around and bringing turkeys uh, to a bunch of landlords. Uh, but basically looking at folks who would be willing to take a risk. Because we recognized a lot of the people that we are working with had credit issues, had criminal histories, had eviction issues. But what we said to those landlords was that if you were willing to give this individual a chance, that our organization will make a commitment to you. That for the first year that we will be there, if you have an issue that's behavioral, if you have an issue that's financial, that we will work to be there to resolve whatever that issue is. Well, we began to build those networks. And the last time I checked, uh, we right now have over 230 uh, landlords and property management companies that work with us that are not part of the system. These are folks who are, have been willing to, to give our people a chance. And because of that relationship, and primarily because of the real desire of folks who want to end their homelessness, over the past three and a half years, JOIN has seen over a thousand people transition from the streets into permanent housing. And because of that, thank you. And because of that relationship that we have with the landlords and that commitment we made to that one year, what we have found that the retention of people staying housed, of us continually working with people once they move into housing, what we found that our retention rate has stayed high. Over the past three and a half years, we have averaged at 85% retention rate of people maintaining or staying inside of their housing for, for that length of time. When we began to look at and talk to uh, other providers, where well, we recognized that re a lot of folks did not even track retention, that the bulk of their programs and energy was about trying to get people to a point to move into housing. And so when we would ask about retention, they didn't know. And so, but for us as an organization, what we said to ourselves is if we are going to commit ourselves as an organization to helping people in their homelessness, that that retention was the most important measure for us as an organization. And it has now become for us almost a mantra when we talk about the system that has been created to work with homeless adults. Is that it's one in the effort to transition folks into housing, but are they maintaining that housing? And that should be our measure of whether we're successful or not. And what we have seen as some agencies have begun to track that is they've recognized that their retention is low and they are beginning to shift how they begin to respond and work with homeless individuals. One of the realities that in doing outreach on the streets that we've discovered is that there is countless amount of energy, time spent through neighborhood associations, uh, with the police, with the different bureaus within the city, the Parks Bureau, uh, Environmental Services, PDOT, who spend money, staff time, in responding to the consequences of literally thousands of people sleeping outside every night. We have begun to describe that as kind of the maintenance of poverty, the maintenance of homelessness. I remember one day, actually, a, a pastor of a church very close to this facility called me up, and he was beside himself. He said, Rob, he goes, I, I, I heard about you through a friend. He says, I just came from a, a church meeting, and our church wants to spend close to $100,000 on a security system, 
on gate, elaborate gates to prevent homeless folks from sleeping on our steps. He says, it breaks my heart that that, you know, is where we're looking at spending our money. And as I look around the city of Portland, that's exactly what I see happening in our parks, uh, in our neighborhoods. Lots of resources, lots, lots of money, uh, and, and people's, out of people's frustration uh, of saying, you know what, we don't want people on our doorsteps. One of the things that JOIN has been trying to do is to go to these neighborhood groups, uh, go to the different bureaus, and, and advocate that they should have some type of relationship with the social service community. It's not enough to just move people on. It's not enough just to call the police. That somehow there needs to be a sophisticated response where we connect people, where we as a community educate ourselves, one, about resources that are there, and that we work collaboratively to create responses that help people transition. Uh, and one of the ways that we've tried to do that is what we've said to the business community, call us. You have somebody sleeping on your doorsteps, instead of calling the police right off the bat, you know, call us and let us come and tr try to somehow resolve whatever, whatever issue might exist. We have found uh, that most of the bureaus, parks, PDOT, uh, have not been real responsive to trying to form some concrete collaboration, which has been a disappointment. We have uh, our greatest collaboration, and it's by no means where we would like it to be, but we have had some collaboration with the Portland Police Bureau. But, and one of the reasons why we, f we feel like we have had a little bit of that collaboration is that they saw it in their own self-interest. <laughs> Instead of them having to deal with, with camps, uh, what they saw is if they had a chance to have an outreach worker and maybe begin to mediate, uh, you know, whatever the issue was, uh, it was less work for them. Uh, Commander Stan Grubbs of Southeast Precinct said to me one time, he says, you know, I used to have on average 22 officers who were dealing with transient issues. He says, now I have two. And what, and what I want, wanted them to do is, is to call you. And so what JOIN has also been doing with the police and PDOT and ODOT is negotiating what we would describe as low profile and high profile camps. Low profile were places where we agreed that people could stay there. The high profile were ones that everyone kind of agreed, all right, it, maybe it doesn't make sense for folks to be there. But what we've learned that if we're going to be able to transition anybody off the streets into permanent housing, that stability needs to be there. And we as a community need to think about when we belong to institutions that are struggling with this dilemma about how to re respond to, to the consequences of thousands of people sleeping outside every night. I also think we need to ask ourselves three questions when we talk about organizations, organizations that have existed for a long time and organizations that, that are new. We, and I, I will give you three questions that uh, I think are criteria for whether this is about actually helping people end their homelessness or rather it's more about the maintenance of homelessness. The first question is, is there an effort to transition people into permanent housing? Not necessarily just transitional, but it is, is there a concrete effort to transition people into permanent housing? The other question I would ask is, what housing are they moving people into? Are we moving people not only into subsidized housing, but are we moving people into the open market? And what we found is folks whose primary issue of why they are homeless is one of economics, and we work with them to get back into the working world, that their pre preference is to move back into the open market, to be normal again. Uh, and we really feel that that sense of freedom uh, is part of why our retention numbers stay high. And the third issue is around retention. That it's not enough to transition people into housing, 
but we need to work with those individuals to stabilize in that housing so that they don't get recycled <laughs> into the system. And I think that's one of the things, the lessons we have learned in engaging folks who have been on the streets for years is that we talk to these individuals and they have been through programs, they have been through shelters, they have been through you know, various institutions, and again, for whatever reason, you know, they found themselves back on the streets. So I would ask all of us as a community to use those criteria as how we judge how well we are doing in responding to the issue of homelessness. And most importantly, that we have to recognize that the homeless individuals that we're working with, they're the key. Our greatest asset is the people themselves. And if their voices are not part of the response to, the, to homelessness, if we're not learning from their wisdom and their life experience in how we respond, then I really feel like we're missing you know, the, the, the essential element, the key of what we as a community need to end homelessness in our society. And I have lots of friends who say, end homelessness? That's not possible. And I say, well, you know what? Uh, that's my dream. And that's how and, uh, and why I do the work and what I believe is a possibility. Thank you. Well, I'm inspired. I wanted to personally uh, express my gratitude to all of you for the work that you do. It's, it's remarkable, and thank you. Uh, as president or as chair of the program committee, when we began to take a look at this issue, we said, who, who are the street people? What, where do they come from? Who are the homeless? And I think you three have done a marvelous job taking us all across the board. And Jean, uh, you outlined many of the sociological changes that have taken place in the last 20 years, the last 30 years, because I'm old enough, too, to remember the time when there weren't people sleeping on the street. So obviously there have been a number of sociological changes that have uh, contributed largely to this, but what have the public policy changes been? Because clearly there have been some at the national level, and what public policy changes should we attempt to implement to reach Rob's goal? Let, let me start with that and then just pass it down the line. I think the public policy changes um, that have occurred, uh, at least two of them come to mind very quickly. Um, one is the decreasing amount of affordable housing, the decreasing amount of funding that is available for aff affordable housing. Um, people wouldn't be homeless if they could afford the cost of rent. And so we have to ensure that in our community there is um, safe, affordable housing for very low income people. And to do that, we need help from the um, housing and urban development to subsidize um, part of the cost of building that housing. So the first one is to ensure that um, there are housing dollars that come to our local community. And I'm, I'm very concerned now with the amount of buildup in our Defense Department budget that that buildup for the Defense Department is going to mean a decrease in the budget for housing and urban development. And I, so I think that um, keeping dollars flowing to the community for affordable, low-cost housing is the first one. The second one clearly is the change in the policy toward uh, mentally ill people, um, that the dollars that are necessary for providing services, while I totally agree that we shouldn't have big institutions the way we had um, prior to the 1970s, um, I think that local communities need resources to deal with people that have mental illness, and those resources aren't here, and therefore communities like ours have their hands tied in trying to deal with people that have an illness like mental illness or an illness like alcohol and drug addiction. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, one of the other uh, areas that actually when we talk about the issue of homelessness uh, does not get touched upon I think uh, enough and that is our criminal justice system. Uh, recently, uh, Sheriff Dan Noli uh, did a study of folks who continue to be rearrested and arrested again uh, and who are in our jail systems. And in his study, which for some of us was pretty self-evident, but what they identified was that if at some point 
there had been some different type of intervention with these individuals, that there had been somebody who at a mental health agency had somehow connected with folks, what they had identified that in the jail system in Multnomah County that over 30% of folks had diagnosable mental health issues, uh, that folks had employment, housing issues, and the result of those issues never being really addressed meant that those in, folks were on the streets again. And being on the streets, you know, often, you know, the reality of being on the streets is you sleep places you're not supposed to sleep. There's this constant interaction uh, with, with the police. And what they have found is there are people who are being arrested and they might only be in overnight, you know, one night, you know, for, what, for whatever reason it might be. But he, in his report, outlines, you know, through just the, the cost of what it takes to arrest somebody, to book somebody, you know, to, to take people through that system, and then they're, they're back on the streets again. And that also acknowledged that a lot of folks that were being let out of jail were being let out of jail, you know, at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, where no, no place to go. And I can't tell you the number of times that at our agency, you know, when we've gone to open up the doors and there are people sitting on our steps who've been sitting there for quite a while because they just got out of jail. So how is it and what is the relationship between the criminal justice system and our social service system? And how are we working with people, you know, in that system to really transform their lives and helping people transition you know, uh, you know, back into community. Uh, so policy-wise, and I, th I would encourage people to actually to look at uh, this report because I think it speaks to, uh, you know, an issue that we often don't like to, to, to talk about that much um, because when we define somebody as a criminal, you know, it's real easy for us just to write people off. But the fa fact is that these are human beings that we need to be working with, uh, and it is all in all of our self-interest to help people, you know, readdress those issues of mental health, addiction, housing. I I also agree that affordable housing is is uh, a huge need in this community, and something that goes along with that is a living wage that people need to be able not only to get a job, but to have a living wage while working at that. <laughs> and then the, the last thing, and just in regards to homeless youth, I wish it were more difficult for parents to give up on their kids and stop providing for them. Yeah. Um, Nan Newell, City Club member. Um, I'd like to continue on the, the mental health issue because I think it's a huge one in our community. And I, uh, there's a couple of issues I'd like you to address. One is, are there other communities who are doing whatever needs to be done better that we could use as a, as a model? And um, secondly, um, I, I agree with you that we don't want to put everybody back in large institutions, but I do think there are a lot of people who are on the street or who may not be on the street being cared for by families at, at, at great emotional and, and uh, economic expense who actually do need to be institutionalized, who do need to have 24-hour medical care. Um, and I would like your response to that question also. Go ahead. Um, as I talk to other people from YWCA's across the country and ask that exact same question, um, I, I find that people across the country are saying, no, we don't have adequate resources for the mentally ill because um, the, the funding comes from the federal government and an inadequate amount of funding comes um, for providing services that, to people that are mentally ill. So um, we always look for uh, programs and kind of models that we could look at. Um, but we have not found them. I am, in particular here in Multnomah County, very encouraged by um, Jim McConnell, who has been the Director of Aging Services, now becoming the person in charge of aging services, um, services to people with mental health problems, and some of the homelessness services. And I, I look forward to seeing if, in this change in county policy, um, to get a broader look, if we can see some additional services to families, 
We're a family member, not necessarily, but children.